I think there's a really interesting set of questions to ask. And in a way, you know, I think this is one of the most interesting aspects of a renewed project that works on the early and middle period manuscripts, which understands them as research sites, right? Acknowledging that research is an anachronistic term, what we can, I think, in principle do is to look at the pathways of inquiry that Newton develops. I mean, we have, I think, three things to bear in mind. First of all, the intensity and level of documentation is high. That's a really important point. Um, we uh, have access now to more and more detailed uh, manuscript records of Newton's projects in the 1660s and after than most comparable figures of the period, maybe anybody. Maybe anybody. And that is really important, right? Um, because I think what that tells us is um, there's been a kind of uh, tradition to make Newton unusual because unknown, to make Newton unusual because impenetrable. You might say the opposite is the case. Actually, in principle, surely we can do better, right? Um, and I think the uh, existing scholarship from Whiteside on the mathematical papers is a model that needs to be applied elsewhere, right? I think that would be an interesting task, which colleagues have only just begun in, it, in fascinating ways. Secondly, are there patterns of inquiry here? Um, could one, I think one could, construct um, an idea in Newton of what for other uh, great uh, scientists has been called the continuum of relative privacy. That's to say the spectrum from deeply private reflection on published and available work that Newton is studying. Um, Robert Boyle's writings on light and colour, Robert Hooke's micrographia, John Wallace's published lectures on um, arithmetic and geometry, Descartes' principles, working through to draft notes, which often have the form of commonplaces, right? From this very early stage in the 1660s, it's very clear that Newton is a fact gatherer. He's extremely interested in what we might call the natural historical dimensions of natural philosophy. A very good example of that is how early he begins taking notes on the positions and movements of the comets, of 1664 and 1665, or on tidal observations from 1664, 1665 and 1666, from Robert Murray and others, where he's processing otherwise slightly challenging material in the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society. Why? Because he's interested in inquiring into the reality or otherwise of the vortex model of earth and moon motions that he's read in Descartes and in Cartesian commentaries. And he begins to accumulate numerical data from that, right? And then what one would add to that is not just Newton's analytic, but also what we might call his arithmetic concerns, which is that wherever possible, Newton is interested in exact data. Newton is interested in numbers. And that's not self-evident in the natural philosophy of this period. Um, so his work on what we now call diffraction, his work on tidology, his work on uh, the motion of planets and moons, presses constantly on the limits of what numerical data are available. And then finally, the way in which in each of the areas that he's inquiring into, the ambition is cosmological. The ambition is always cosmological. The ambition is always to build a system which would, perhaps not exhaustively, but as completely as the evidence allows, describe all of that aspect of creation which is encompassed by this field of inquiry. So whether that's reading the books of prophecy or reading astronomical texts or reading texts on optics 
or reading mathematical lectures, the ambition is global. And that is very striking from a very early age. So I think pathways can be identified, which we might then be able retrospectively to identify as characteristically Newtonian. 